So today we are going to deal with the shock syndrome, the circulatory disorders, or another name, hypoperfusion syndrome. The shock or the circulatory disorder usually is uh, defined as a physiological state when we do have a significant system reduction in the tissue perfusion and the consequence be a decreased tissue oxygenation delivery and an insufficient removal of the cellular metabolic product resulting in tissue injury. So if you cannot take enough oxygen, enough nutrient to the periphery, this is one thing. And then the other one, the end product, the metabolic product that produced by the cells, it cannot be removed. So these toxic waste can kill the cells, can damage the cells, and that again can be a problem. Now, based on this one, what we have to do, we have to have a normal perfusion. What do we have to have for a normal perfusion? We have to have enough oxygen in the blood. The oxygen content of the blood, of course, is going to be dependent on a lot of things. We have to have enough glucose and other nutrient for the cells. And of course, delivery, this should be pumped, this should be delivered, and the carbon dioxide elimination. And this perfusion needs at least three different things. First of all, we have to have a normal pump function, a normal heart function. Next one, we have to have an adequate transport medium, such as a blood, and the blood should contain enough hemoglobin that can bind, first of all, the oxygen and can help to remove the carbon dioxide from periphery. And of course, the vessels, the tube system should be intact. It cannot be leaked out. So whatever is coming from the heart, it should reach to the periphery and should come back. And another thing, this hemoglobin, when coming back, the venous side should be oxygenated, should be refilled with oxygen, and should exhale the carbon dioxide. So should eliminate the waste product and should be, let's see, uh, fill up with the normal oxygenation. Now, if you do have a problem with the circulation, with this perfusion, that can be a short happening, such as a syncope, orthostatic collapse, uh, carotis hyperesthesia, electric shock, spinal cord injury, and so on and so on, but can be a long term that those terms, those sequence even relatively leading to a fatal uh, death uh, or the death, and that is called the shock syndrome. study. A male, age 65, a divorce lawyer developed severe abdominal pain initially at the precordial and epigastric area about four hours ago. Pain was sudden, which increases in the minutes, radiates to the back aspect of the thorax, was associated with diaphoresis, shortness of the breath, and dizziness, nausea, and feeling of death. So it looks like the patient was having an angina or maybe a myocardial MI. He tried at home with oral antacids, but there was not improved. Now I said before that could be an MI, especially the inferior one, that usually the pain can occur in the epigastrial area. Now let's see what will happen in the past medical history. He previously had an episode of exacerbation of COPD, possible because he was smoking, that's one 
uh, was one year ago. And COPD is due to heavy tobacco smoking since adulthood, two to four packages cigarettes per day. Systemic hypertension since the age of 45 without regular control. Two previous myocardial MI, last one four years ago, and he was carried to the Dallas perform angioplasty and double bypass surgery. He did not follow the secondary prevention treatment for sure, they are not taking aspirin or clopidogel, and hypercholesterolemia he had since age of 40. He refuses to low fat diet and is not taking lipid lowering uh, drugs such as the statins. He drinks a lot, he's a heavy alcohol drinker, one bottle of tequila or rum every day since the age of 20s. Now, which probably he has a Lennox cirrhosis. The previous episode of dyspepsia and two episodes of upper GI bleeding due to the duodenal ulcer he had, got in an intercritical phase. Parents died for hypercholesterolemia and cerebrovascular diseases, so this patient possibly has a familiar history, so some kind of heritage, hyperlipidemia, hypercholesterolemia, possible he has a heterozygosiform. We are going to deal with this uh, cholesterolemia, hypercholesterolemia a little bit later. Now, physical examination, the blood pressure was very low, 90 to 50, over 50 millimercury. The heart rate was 120 BPM. So if you calculate the shock index, such as the heart rate divided by the systolic pressure, it's over one. The temperature is okay. The weight is 55 and the high is 165 centimeters, so a little bit skinny one. Pale patient, skinny, anxious, cyanotic, the lips and the nails, dyspnea, tahipnea, alert, and dehydrated. The carotid without birth, uh, but both passes are diminished in strength, no masses, and adenopathies. Inspection, the thorax checks barrel aspect, so it looks like it's emphysema with type 9. Ascultation, bilateral bronchial rails, and wheezing, bilateral hypoventilation, so they do have some kind of uh, COPD, he went from COPD. Heart sun, arrhythmic, tachycardic, with articular systolic murmur, degree over 2 or 26, cardiac apex at the 6 intercostal space, at the anterior axillary line, axillary zone is normal. Abdomen, by auscultation, peristaltic sound diminished. Palpation, no masses or bruits, no liver or spleen enlargement, tenderness at upper abdomen, pain with deep full palpation, no garbage sign and kidney is normal. So out of this one, maybe we can um, let's see and light, and then light the no sound in the GI tract on the bowels. The urinary bladder catheter was placed and gives about 20 ml of concentrated urine. So he has an urea or alumbolic urea. Less spontaneous nicturias was about six hours ago and lower limbs scarce for bilateral spherectomy for the bypass grafting there was no edema femoral popliteal and peripas are diminished so atherosclerosis distal temperature cold so the extremities was cold and the capillary flow return diminished and distal cyanosis this is what we want the lab value shows decreased hemoglobin, so it may add hematocrit. Why blood cell count is elevated, so based on this one, anemia he has. And elevated why blood cell count could be due to inflammatory reaction. Potassium level is increased, chloride level increased, uh, glucose level is higher, one blood urea nitrogen is elevated, creatinine level is elevated. Uric acid level is elevated because he had some cut. AST level and ALT level, so the liver function enzymes is elevated. Albumin level is low. That could be due to cirrhosis, for example. 
and uh, apt ta apt time uh, that resembles to let's see the coagulation factor and the pt time is elevated as well ECG shows the subendocardial ischemia and changes for all the myocardial MI, so he had two episodes. Abdominal excrete, dissension of the small bowels, calcification of abdominal aorta, which can be sign of atherosclerosis, kidneys and liver without relevant abnormalities. All right, so abdominal ultrasound. Abdominal ultrasound shows the liver, decrease in size with a cirrhotic pattern. In the gallbladder, they found one large stone and the wall is thickened about two millimeters. Pancreas is not visible. Spleen enlarged is a splenomegaly due to the increased portal hypertension. And kidney with some scars and reduced in size. And no free fluid in abdomen, so it looks like there's no ascites. And abdominal aorta, infrarenally in the aneurysm, probably with acute dissection. Now, abdominal CTs not performed because the patient develops irreversible shock and transferred immediately to the ICU. Yes, uh, this patient had a dissection of the aorta, and this means that he has to have an acute intervention immediately. So what they use, IV energetic, multiple transfusion, colloid and crystal solution. But the, uh, the patient persists with shock and develops generalized scissors and severe bradycardia. And the tracheal intubation, assisted ventilation and cardiac neutralization. So they did what they could. And the show it tachycardia with atropine administration but shock remained. Two minutes later, the patient started with tahi and bradyarrhythmias, atrial and ventricular, and finally bradycardia, asystolia, and dead. So this is what will happen in shock. First, we do have an initiation phase, and this phase could be maintained for a long time, but after a while, there is no turning back, and that's be irreversible. So this is the stages of the classic shock. First of all, as mentioned, at the beginning, we do have a compensated one. The body is able to compensate and maintain tissue perfusion. Now, this situation, what's going on during this compensatory phase, it leads to the progression. Body begins to lose its ability to compensate, and... Finally, inadequate perfusion begins. And this inadequate perfusion lead to the irreversible phase where cell and tissue damage happening and results in multi-system organ failure. And this is what leads to the death. Now, on this one, if you look at this graph, the oxygen delivery or the demand, the first phase, when we do have, that's a compensated. Now, the next one, all that's a decompensated size. At the beginning, when we do have, let's see, the subacute and irreversible one, or reversible one, I'm sorry, reversible one, that if you act right away and if you treat the patient relatively, they can go back to the normal situation and survive the shock. Another one, the irreversible, the patient by the treatment is we respond. But after a while, you can do whatever you like, but that's be irreversible. And another one for sure that acute irreversible as a continuation of this decompensation leads to the death very soon. Now these are the different stages based on the pathophysiologic event. First of all, we do have some reason why somehow the perfusion is altered. The low cardiac output or vasodilation, and that can be compensated. And because the decreased perfusion, the mage and organ perfusion or the dysfunction is happening, and is still potentially reversible. But the patient starts to 
develop the compensate stage. And when the microcirculatory failure and endothelial damage occurs, now that can be the initiation of the irreversible phase. And when after the cellular membrane injury and cell death happening, now that be the completely irreversible shock situation. Now what kind of markers we can use to monitor the shock? First of all, we can look at the systolic pressure. Usually the systolic pressure is less than 110 millimercury. Tachycardia occurs, the heart beats usually is over 90 beats per minute. Shock index, as I mentioned before, that the pulse divided by the systolic pressure, it should be equal or over 1. The respiratory rate can be low or can be high depending on the stage or depending on the cause. Urine output usually is very low. The metabolic acidemia happening. All the time in shock, we do have a metabolic acidosis, meaning that the actual bicarbonate level is going to decrease and the base access be negative. So the base deficit, which means the base access is negative. Hypoxemia, but the hypoxemia, or it's depending on the age, relatively, if the age is between 0 to 50, you have to consider as a oxygenation of the, the partial pressure of the oxygen should be less than 90 millimercury, but you know, elderly one less than 80, and it's an old one less than 70 millimercury. And the continuous vasoconstriction, the peripheral vasoconstriction, and vasodilation can happen depending on the type of the shock. Mental changes, usually this patient is anxious, agitated, and, or indifference, or lethargy, up to danger, depending on the phase of the shock. Now let's see the classification of the shock. So what can lead, what is the initial problem that leading to the irreversible shock syndrome? First of all, the most commonly evaluated and the mostly researched shock type is the hypovolemic shock. The classic shock is a very common one, is the standard used to compare other forms of shock for differential diagnosis. The hypovolemic shock, basically we are losing the blood, losing the fluid, and that can be the hemorrhagic shock, that's a blood loss, but can be caused by dehydration when we're losing fluid. And because we are, don't have enough feeling for the fluid, we cannot Let's see, maintain the normal circulation. The obstructive shock that can be due to the obstructing the vessel somehow, so the blood flow is stopped, such as the pulmonary embolization. When it's happening, it is stopped in the pulmonary circulation. It has to be a big uh, artery that is usually is blocked. But for example, pneumothorax extension or increased intrathoracic pressure can alter the circulation in the lung. Or cardiac tamponade, or there's a pressure in the myocardium and decrease the preload, for example. It can be cardiogenic shock when the pump function of the heart is failing. Usually 40% of the myocardial damage is due to by acute myocardial MI, but mostly due to arrhythmias, for example, ventricular fibrillation. Another one, it's interesting one, that's the distributive shock. In distributive shock, there are at least three different categories, such as a neurogenic shock, when we do not have a normal neuronal tone maintained of the vascular resistance. So we do have a vasodilation due to the, let's say, the failure of the sympathetic stimulation anaphylaxia or anaphylactic shock, when we do have a vasodilation due to the EGE mediated degranulation of the mastocytes or histamine liberation, and that is going to cause vasodilation and clot formation and bronchospasm, so respiration plus the peripheral perfusion will be abnormal. And the septic usually is the combination of this all, vasodilation, fluid shifting due to the overwhelming infection, and heart deterioration, so 
and the bacterial uh, infection. So that's leading very fast to the final stage of shock. Let's start to discuss first the hypovolemic shock, hemorrhage, that can be due to trauma, surgery, aneurysm rupture, in our case, for example, but hematorrhex or hematomas, and hemophilia caused a hemorrhage or bleeding disorders, or overdose of anticoagulant, for example, or thrombolytic therapy, and other, for example, excess fluid loss from the GI tract, vomiting, diarrhea, especially infant and, and children can happen this one. Urinary tract fluid loss, in diabetes insipidus, when the patient is losing a lot of diluted urine and cannot, let's say, drink enough water, or diabetes mellitus, the osmotic diuresis, or salt wasting disorders in the kidney, for example, or adrenocortical insufficiency, such as endocrine disorders, and overdose of diuretics, all can lead to the fluid loss through the kidney. But we can lose fluid from the skin, excessive burn when we are losing extracellular fluid, or skin inflammation, for example, dermatitis, exfoliative dermatitis, all can lead to hypovolemia. Or internal sequestration of the fluid, for example, we are uh, losing fluid for the interstitial places, for the cavities, chronic liver disease, where we do have ascites, and from the circulation, the, uh, let's see, the, uh, blood uh, the blood volume decreases. Or in acute pancreatitis due to, uh, for example, peritonitis, when we do have the fluid sequestration. And angioedema, this whole thing will decrease the fluid volume in the circulation. Now let's see what will happen with the cardiac output when we do have a hypovolemia. This is the curve where we do, let's see if you evaluate the preload and the cardiac output. As you see here, we are moving down all the way here. So this way, the cardiac output will decrease if you don't have enough feeling volume. So if you decrease the preload. What will happen when you give back the fluid to the patient, relatively, it can go back to the normal cardiac output. So you have to refill it. Now, let's see the different stages of this uh, hemorrhagic shock. Let's see the first one when we do have the compensation is working on. When we do have a volume depletion, as we listed before, the uh, body is going to detect that something happened with the blood pressure or something happened with the volume and because the cardiac output starts to decrease. That will increase the sympathetic nervous system and releasing epinephrine, norepinephrine to stimulate the alpha and the beta receptors. What will happen? Vasoconstriction, usually in the periphery. So this is why the cold extremities, for example, is the hallmark of this situation. And bronchodilation and tachycardia can develop uh, due to the release of the sympathetic stimulation. Uh, what will happen? The neural and immediate response occurs and that initiates the sympathetic system. If, for example, the preload decreases, the low pressure receptors is firing, and these low pressure receptors is located in the arterial wall and the pulmonary arteries and the great veins and the ventricles. Another one, when the cardiac output decreases, the high pressure receptors sensing it, but it's located in the aortic arch and the carotid sinus. And the chemoreceptor is usually turning on when the main artery pressure, the mean artery pressure decreases below 50 millimercury. And these receptors, chemoreceptors located in the carotid and the aortic bodies. If it decreases further, if it decreases, the VAP decreases below 40, then the central nervous system ischemic response turning on. So we do have a massive sympathetic innervation and stimulation to the body such as we have having a vasoconstriction, those vessels that sensitive to this one, such as the kidney, splenic area, muscle, and adipocytes, adipotissues. 
beta 1 receptor, for example, the heart, that stimulates the heart rate and increases the cardiac output, but a lot of energy needed because if you want to increase the cardiac output but increasing the heart rate, that takes up a lot of energy and decreases the diastolic time. So it meaning that the coronary circulation is altered. At the B2 receptor, usually alters the metabolism. For example, mobilize glucose, induces lipolysis. This is what we have. And other one, intrinsic or intermediate response, this usually happening a little bit later on. So, for example, when the capillary pressure decreases, the interstitial fluid goes back to the vasculature. And that means in the first hour, we can have about one liter transfusion, an autotransfusion that maintains the vascular, let's see, fluid level. But it's maximum two liters can come back from, back from the interstitial spaces. When we do have hyperglycemia and the osmotic effect is sucking the water with it in the vasculature, and usually that can give you well, not too much, about 70 milliliter per one millimole per glucose, so it's almost nothing. Later on, the humoral response turn on, but that's a delayed response. Usually it occurs within days when the ADH secretion turn on. This is why the patient feeling thirsty and wants to conserve the water and produces more concentrated urine. Aldosterone, that aldosterone, renin angiotensin aldosterone system, first of all, increases the blood pressure, the preferred vasoconstriction, plus induces the sodium reabsorption and the water comes with the sodium. What will be the consequence of this one? At the beginning, the almost we do have a normal cerebral and cardiac circulation until the pressure is the pressure is 70 to 90. But this circulation is usually maintained by the peripheral vasoconstriction. This is why the peripheral pressure or peripheral resistance is increases. The patient will have skin pale and kidney less blood supply, so decreases the diuresis, so the blood, uh, urine volume decreases, and the muscle gets less oxygen, less nutrient, so weakness, that's been the general symptom. In a progressive phase, when we mentioned that the vasopressin ADH, which increases the vasoconstriction by closing the capillary sphincters, greatly reducing the peripheral circulation, and that's a hypoperfusion it will cause some accumulation of the metabolic waste products in the periphery. In a normal metabolic system, when we do have an aerobic system, we do not have too much waste product accumulation, mostly carbon dioxide as be the end product, and carbon dioxide can be removed through a periphery very easily because it's diffusing out almost readily. However, if you do have an anaerobic condition, the lactic acid accumulation can occur, and of course, the lactate production is not associated with very good ATP production because the efficacy of the energy production is very low in anaerobic condition. Now, and this can lead to relatively the irreversible stage. What can be the mechanism? The compensatory mechanism that maintains the normal circulation is going to fail. So what will happen? In the periphery, we do have a lot of acid production. And the acid is going to open up the sphincters. So it's going to cause vasodilation in the periphery and vasoconstriction in the lung. Microembolization that happens due to the stasis, what's happening in the periphery, and other waste product that gets into the circulation. So whatever accumulated in the periphery, as so far as was locked out, no due to this vasodilation, general vasodilation, the old waste product is washed back to the systemic circulation and can deteriorate some other organ, such as heart, such as brain, such as lung. And this means the cell damage and organ failure develops 
and the death occurs. So this is the irreversible stage, and this are the mechanism for this one. Let's see the next is a cardiogenic shock. The cardiogenic shock when we do not have a normal pump function, wherefore somehow we cannot pump the fluid into the periphery and from the periphery it doesn't return. That can be due to the pump function. That can be due to MI, for example. So, for example, arrhythmia or asthma cardiale, severe acidosis, barbiturate toxicity, a toxic in a septic shock, for example, or valvular problem, stenosis or regurgitation, septal rupture, pericardial tamponade, tumor thorax, embolization. So a lot of things can alter the mechanism of the pumping, and this is leads to the cardiogenic shock. Now, as you see here in a cardiogenic shock, relatively this is a normal situation and what will happen when the heart doesn't pump normally this curve is a little bit lower so if we do have this problem it's meaning that the cardiac output is decreased what will happen if we are going to fill up with fluid nothing too much because the heart is unable to pump this fluid what we have so it's not the problem with losing the fluid from the circulation but the biggest problem that the pumping mechanism. Now, uh, the distributive shock. This is the other type that we de uh, de discussed, and that's relatively the vasodilative uh, situation. As we mentioned before, the neurogenic one usually happening when the spinal cord injury occurs, or when you overdose the drug or poisons affecting the nervous, the sympathetic nervous system and that cannot maintain the normal vascular tool and leads to vasodilation. Anaphylaxia. If something triggers the anaphylaxia, again, a massive vasodilation and the fluid shift from the capillary to the cells or the interstitial media. And that's due to the microclotic mechanism that can cause dissonant intravascular coagulation and a smooth muscle uh, contraction in the lung. So bronchospasm can happen. And the septic one is what we are going to talk about. The vasodilation and fluid shift is due to the overwhelming infection and the perfecting. The distributive shock, if you want to summarize what are the different categories of distributive shock. First of all, the patient has a normal blood volume. They do have a normal tension. And uh, decreased total peripheral resistance due to the general vasodilation. So how can we maintain, let's say, the normal tension? Well, increased cardiac output. So it means this patient has a tachycardia. So the cardiac output increases about two to three fold. What will happen? Because the periphery, we do have vasodilation. Usually the extremities are warm and red, and for sure, as I mentioned, the heart rate is increased. Now, as you see here, what will happen? We are going to shift, let's see this curve to the left, and this goes down, and if you feel up, yes, relatively, you can have a normal cardiac output, but the heart working as hell. Now, what will happen in the hyperdynamic stage? First of all, we do have the accumulation of lactic acid because there is no time. It's not enough to take the fluid to the periphery, but you have to have enough contact time to let, let's see, the waste product to absorb and the oxygen to fuse in. If there's a, let's see, the velocity is very fast, the contact time is very short, Again, we do not have a normal perfusion in the periphery. And what will happen? The changes in amino acid metabolism, the tyrosine and octopamine that inhibits the alpha receptors and further vasodilation occurs. Usually, for example, in septic shock or any situation, we do have an increased nitric oxide production, such as cytokine induced or endotoxin induced, INOS, the inducible nitric oxide synthase activity, so more NO production. 
and as I mentioned, relative oxygen deficit in the periphery due to the abnormal vaccine diffusion that's happening in the periphery due to the low conduct time. The anaphylactic shock usually this sensitized the individual, the patient exposed to the antigen that triggered the EG mediated activation of the muscles. And what will happen? Relatively vasodilation again or decreased sympathetic innervation of the vasculature, for example, drugs, fruits, uh, white nuts, or seafood can initiate this anaphylactic reaction. Direct smooth muscle cell relaxation due to the endotoxin or endotoxin induced cytokine release. Now, the septic shock is a multiple uh, initiation or multiple pattern mechanism. First of all, we do have a direct tissue damage, and the tissue damage can be sterile, it still will induce inflammation. Hemorrhage, that leads to hypovolemia, that leads to hypoxia, tissue injury, again inflammation is turned on. Infection, the bacteria that are going to cause inflammation and sepsis, and this is going in trauma, that's going to happen the all. This is why in trauma, that's the septic shock develops mostly, and that's very, very dangerous situation. Reperfusion. That's a very interesting situation, this reperfusion. Usually the large arteries, for example, the artery of femoralis, or mesenterical artery, when somehow is occluded, for example, falling a big tree or a car in a car accident and usually uh, strangle the arteries. And if you go there, well, you are talking to the patient and they don't have any problem. But when you, re after a while, when you remove, let's see, this uh, closure and what happening, the waste product that accumulated in the closed artery, it, let's see, is distal to the closed artery, nice washed into the circulation that's be almost identical what happening in the late phase of irreversible shock and the reperfusion again triggered the liberation of the mediators and that's worsening and the patient is going to die now the reperfusion injury that usually due to the severe hypoxia or anoxia and that causes the endothelial cells damage there are different types of reperfusion. That's an early reperfusion. Relatively, that's in the capillaries, the no reflow happening, or in the reflow paradox, when in the postcapillar venules, that the microembolization that can happen, and uh, that be the late diffusion. Late diffusion usually is associated with an inflammatory reaction. Now, what will be the consequence of the delayed uh, or the delayed consequence of reperfusion. First of all, inflammatory reaction that can be localized on the area when we do have the abnormality, but can be diffused because the old metabolize is going to wash, up, wash into the circulation and diffusely entering and uh, damaging the system. The compensatory mechanism by apoptosis or tendency to regenerate, but usually happening in the late phase. But hemorrhagic necrosis can happen when the blood is going to enter into the damaged area. And again, that will promote more hemorrhage and fluid loss. But what will cause the tissue damage? The tissue damage finally is due to when the cells losing the integrity and calcium entering intracellularly and the elevated calcium level causes the damage of the other cells. Enzyme activation due to this calcium, for example, phospholipase A2 or different uh, oxygenated or free radical accumulation on ions. Primary mediators are usually the histamine, eicosanoids, and no peptides. Cell, cell interaction, the endothelial layer, they are going to adhere the polymorphonuclear cells that releases mediator. As you heard in the previous lecture about inflammation, so relatively the cell damage can happen, and this is how the body is respond to any kind of uh, noxin. 
Let's look at how the ogres are affected in shock. Let's see the muscle. As we said, the muscle usually they have hypoperfusion. We do have about 30-40% of the body mass as a muscle, and that can have a very good role of the hemodynamic because it can store a lot of blood and can release some blood, but metabolic products is produced. Now, if we do have, for example, a filtration increase, when we do have, for example, the, uh, a permeability increase, the blood volume can decrease and a lot of cytokines can release from the damaged cells and that further that can uh, aggregate the hypoperfusion and the hypovolemia in the systemic system. What will happen in the muscle and the tissue in shock? The tumor necrosis factor that inhibits the pyrate dehydrogenase and act on the muscle, the glucose uptake will increase, the glucose oxidation will decrease, pyrate releases increases and lactate release increases so again the acidic substances will release increase protein degradation the leucine dissemination that leads to the cattle bodies for example and the pyrate the amino group forming the alanine so the plasma the amino acid level it will increase that's the life uh, the proteolysis happening in the uh, muscle so a lot of alanine gets into the circulation and goes to the liver. Now what will happen in the bowel, because bowel is a shock organ and responding very well to the sympathetic stimulation. Now they are, but due to the hypoxia, they can release some, it's called myocardial depressing factor. And that release from the pancreas. So far as we do have a vasoconstriction, this not happening, is not getting back to the circulation. But when we do have a vasodilation, immediately can deteriorate the heart function. Now, this circulatory redistribution is centralized the perfusion. But when the heavy perfusion occurs, well, it's a huge area, usually a lot of toxic waste product, and basically bacteria can invade back to the vessels and can uh, cause a big, huge systemic uh, problem disintegration during the perfusion. The therapeutic possibilities usually be removing the bowel content and supply with antibiotic the patient to prevent the bacterial uh, invasion. Kidney. Uh, basically, the kidney is a secondary organ. So kidney responds very well to the sympathetic stimulation, but uh, it can form a part of the multi-organ failure. Now, at the beginning, we do have a constriction, and that meaning that uh, the kidney is able, about 20% of the blood goes to the kidney. And if we have this 20% conservation, so relatively we can maintain the blood fluid for a very long time. However, if you are looking at the kidney, you learn in physiology the kidney, the internal circulation of the kidney is maintained for a very wide uh, pressure range. Between 80 millimercury to 250, the circulation of the kidney or the medulla is about the same, but below is not. So what will happen? First of all, the kidney is losing the concentrating capability. All right, this is why, and in looking at the diuresis decreases, the ADH and aldosterone, and later on, when the oxygenation and the tubular function is altered, we do have a problem with, the, for example, with the tubular cells, a tubular necrosis can develop. So what will happen? anuria and uremia develops very slowly because the waste product accumulation. Now if you look at the lab parameters, very sensitive way to detect, let's see, the volume, volume regulation and the hypovolemia caused the kidney function alteration is the blood urea nitrogen. This will increase immediately if you do have any kind of volume loss.
Later on, the creatine level starts to increase, and later on, the kidney can be shut down almost completely. So what can we do? We can use dialysis, and this dialysis, it can somehow regain the kidney function later on to help the kidney to recover. Uh, we, we have a lecture about the kidney function later on, and you will see that the acute kidney injury how can be uh, treated with dialysis and why the dialysis is helping to the kidney. Now let's see what's happening in the lung during the shock. As a part of the multi-organ failure, the mortality about 70% and mostly that's the kid and that's the lung problem. Basically, everything in the late phase somehow can be described as an overactivation of the immune response, so the inflammation. What will happen? If the inflammation is localized in the lung, the lung tissue, liquid sequestration in the alveoli, and closing the alveoli or filling up the alveoli, so there's no gas exchange. That is due to the thromboxin, endotoxin, or immune cell activation and increased permeability membrane. The lung is extremely sensitive. And finally, they develop an adult respiratory distress syndrome. Does not matter what was the cause of, let's see, the shock, the circuit disorders. During the reperfusion, everything is end up with the immune mediated common pathways and localized in the lung, relatively, we develop a tissue injury. So that's be the adult respiratory distress syndrome that leads to pulmonary failure. Adipocyte. Well, adipocytes, relatively, we can think that Oh, a lot of energy. So those patients who has more adipocytes relatively have a very good chance to survive because they do have more energy stored in the lipid uh, molecules. However, relatively those who is obese, they have a higher chance to die. Now, what can be what can be the problem with this patient? Because when we do have the centralization, when we do have a sympathetic activation, in the adipocyte, relatively, the blood circulation almost zero. So shutting out, let's see, the adipocyte from the circulation. Okay, that's very good. If somebody has, let's see, a huge amount of adipose tissue, relatively, now we can gain back a lot of fluid. Yeah, but what will happen, by If this, let's see, side is logged out, but the sympathetic stimulation is going to activate the lipolysis locally. And a lot of waste product can accumulate in the adipocyte. Or, for example, the oxygenated product, so peroxidase activation, the free radical formation, leads those accumulation inside the adipose tissue and because the bigger mass produces more mediator, so relatively more active immune cells is released back during the reperfusion, and the damage of the other organs are higher ones. So ARDS, cardiac depression, or neural depression are happening, and the patient relatively will die. So in this case, the progressive phase and the irreversible phase be very dangerous and very short and very dramatic in uh, obese people. Liver. The liver, uh, the liver in the shock. Okay, let's first of all talk about a little bit about the endocrine system. Now, if we do have, for example, the release of epinephrine and the level of the glucose will increase due to First of all, from the liver, the glycogen stores is lysed, plus it will turn on the gluconeogenesis together with the cortisol that causes the protein degradation, as we discussed in the 
uh, muscle cells. Glucagon level increases, usually insulin level will decrease. And this is due to the cytokines release. And what will happen? These kind of mediators affecting of the liver, the hepatocytes as well. Such free cytokines, nitric oxide, immune cells, hormone, and so on that we discussed before. Now, what will happen? We do have an increased amino acid supplies, as we discussed, because due to the proteolysis from the muscle, a lot of aladin and glutamine is going to get into the liver. So, and what will happen? Well, the liver is going to produce, and not only this, but increase lactic acid to the circulation and pyrate supplies to the liver. Now, what will happen? An ammonia nitrogen gets into the liver as well, so a lot of carbon is produced. Now, when the liver, func liver uh, function is altered, what will happen? Relatively, we do have less absorption of the aroma ring containing uh, amino acids, for example, phenylalanine and tyrosine. But the leucine doesn't change. This is why, for example, the ratio of the leucine and the tyrosine or the leucine and the phenylalanine can be used to indicate the severity of the shock. So it's meaning that the absorption of the phenylalanine is decreases. The leucine is not. This is why this ratio will decrease if we do have a severe shock situation. Now, hyperglycemia with the consequence due to the gluconeogenesis, the lactate, the pyrate, and amine, and nutrient sense plate favor that overworking and the favor of multi-special bacteria. So these kind of substances that released out from the liver, it can have for the bacteria, and that can promote, let's say, the inflammatory reaction. And in inflammation, as you know, the fibrinogen level, it will increase. So that will uh, cause to the increased coagulation, increased complement activation, plus the fibrolysis as well. So... This is why, for example, the fibrinogen level in traumatic and septic shock indicates, again, the severity of the shock. And these are the acute phase protein, as you learned in the inflammatory lecture. An acute phase protein that usually, as I mentioned before, that's increased or due to the increased evidence in supply, cytokines, and the reticular endothelial system. C-reactive protein, that this is what we are using, for example, for checking the acute inflammatory reaction, and uh, that will cause the further migration of the granulocytes or can increase the utterance of the phagocytes and, and the COP activate the complement cascade and, and the start of scavenger, free, uh, free radical scavengers released by this. Well, we reach the end of this lecture, but before you go away, please watch this little video. And somehow the cheerfulness is the best promoter to health and is friendly to mind as to the body as well. Let's look at the video. Hey, nice dog. Yeah, this is Piper, your bred border collie. Watch this. Piper, fetch. <laughs> Good boy, Piper, you're such a smart dog. So, uh, what can your dog do? Fergus, Bud Light. Head <laughs> <laughs> dog. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll see you soon.